part three of the volume is called A Cultural Phenomenon, Did Shakespeare Write Shakespeare? And, and here it's a sense of the afterlife of the discussion, the kinds of energies which it makes possible. We've just mentioned earlier Paul Franson's um, overview of fictional treatments of Shakespeare's authorship from the University of Utrecht. Um, Kath, Kate, uh, Kate McCluskey is writing about the contemporary desire to tell stories rather than to get bogged down in historical fact and that fictions will always be more attractive to the human mind than truth with gags um, because it's part of what um, makes the story palatable. But that's what I would say that, the, that, that the orthodox story, the orthodox, so well no I don't agree and I think by using the term conspiracy theory you're trying to just automatically dismiss it thing that doesn't agree with your point of view and I think you know actually there are valid points of view um, on all sides of this debate. It's interesting how the authorship discussion, the Shakespeare authorship discussion hovers in the background of other discussions about what might seem much more serious conspiracy theories such as those around 9-11 I think this is an entirely false comparison because we're not talking about conspiracy theories. We're Sorry, we must be talking about conspiracy theory if we say. If we say about, if no, excuse me, agree. excuse me, just one moment. If you are saying that there is massive evidence that somebody called Shakespeare was associated with these plays, if you're then saying that that man wasn't Shakespeare, you're saying that the real Shakespeare, and you're not disputing that the real Shakespeare existed, no. that he, that there was a conspiracy in which he took part to conceal the true authorship and that he was the front man for it. Now, a conspiracy is not the same as a conspiracy theory. Conspiracies do exist. The word conspiracy has been in the dictionary for a long time. Shakespeare himself writes about conspiracies. There were an enormous number of plots, you know, the Babington plot and the main plot and the by plot of that time, which are all conspiracies. Well, let's call that's this one very, the anti-Shakespeare plot. That's very like. different from a conspiracy theory. A conspiracy theory means something that's not even worth our time of day to look at. We'll just yeah, dismiss it out of hand. <laughs> and I appreciate that you think that that's what the North Strap board, it's not worth your time of day because your belief is very, very strong. No, it's not belief. It it's is our, belief. It's our knowledge based on evidence. Well, it's based on evidence that doesn't actually all add up. Well, there, there, there we fundamentally we do disagree. fundamentally disagree. We fundamentally yes. disagree. Um, and you know, this is the kinds of discussion which the book is making available. Let's not forget this declaration of reasonable doubt. Um, there we have Michael York, Derek Jacobi, and Mark Rylands, all prominent actors. Who you've called anti Shakespeareans. I think it's very interesting. Yeah, they're Shakespearean actors with anti Shakespearean But they're not anti Shakespearean. No well, they one all think Shakespeare didn't write Shakespeare. Yeah, no one involved in this is anti Shakespearean. Everyone I know who is a Shakespeare skeptic loves the author Shakespeare, loves the works of Shakespeare, gets so deeply the, involved. Then why in do they them. want Shakespeare strapped upon Avon to be the well, author? It's not a matter of wanting, you see. You seem to think that there's some kind of pathology going on here. It's a matter of not being searching for the author and then finding him strangely absent. And then looking at the evidence and saying, well, why doesn't this evidence exist? But do you see denials? When it does exist for other people. De de denials of history. It's not are, a denial of history. But you have, if you look at this completely neutrally, if you came to the evidence entirely neutrally and you looked at the 70 plus documents relating to William Shakespeare of Stratford, and you know, some historian looked at this guy and it didn't have that name on it, and you asked him, what does this guy do for a living? Uh, any neutral historian would say, well, he buys and sells grain, he buys and sells ties, he lends money, interest, he chases people through the courts. He's a businessman, he's a broker, he even brokered a marriage. He, you can see him in the role of broker, that is documented. Now, mm -hmm. if he was a writer, all the evidence during his lifetime that he was a writer, I'm, I agree with you that once you get to 1623, it is established that William Shakespeare of Stratford-upon-Avon is the author of the works, and people then start coming to Stratford, not finding much, I have to say, because apparently his daughters don't seem to know that he's a writer. Uh, other people who should have known that he was a writer don't seem to know that he's a writer. Well, his daughter's an interesting example, because alongside Shakespeare's grave is Susanna... Paul's Paul, grave, yeah. witty above her sex, but that's not all. Why to salvation of good mistress? There was something of Shakespeare was in that. But this home of his with whom is now chief and dying bliss. So she is um, evoked as the poet's daughter in that she. Why would he leave? Why would he leave her function illiterate? Why would she not be able to recognise her husband's handwriting? She could write. The well, documents you, there, in the if you actually class. look, if you look at her handwriting, she's not someone who's very, you know, who was. What does that mean to look Come at someone's handwriting? That's nonsense. She's my not doctor very doesn't literate, have, my she doctor doesn't does recognise her husband's me, own handwriting. My doctor does not have very good handwriting, but he gives me the right tablets, and it doesn't mean to say that he's illiterate. 
and this, and his, and but also you're talking about the it. absence of evidence. If you're talking about the absence of evidence, where is the evidence, the positive evidence that Marla wrote Shakespeare or that the Earl of Oxford I absolutely wrote Shakespeare. agree with you. That, but the point is that all of all of the candidates, including yours, who you believe to be the true author, we know the they all evidence. have all based on circumstantial evidence. Based and, on evidence. But it's circumstantial and it's circumstantial. Based on evidence. How could you like how would any of these anti Shakespeareans like the evidence to be? How bad would you like it to be? Be before you start denying and saying well actually black is white. I think, we're on, is, I think we're on very dangerous ground in construing history in our own image in this way. I don't I mean, think that's what's happening here. I think perhaps it might be. Let's look at this quotation from the Declaration of Reasonable Doubt chapter by Stuart Hampton Reeves. Um, he's asking about what it's, what it's achieved. Um, it's, it, it started in 2007, it's out there. It, it was thought that um, the film Anonymous was going to increase the signatures. Um, it didn't. Uh, there are spaces on that document reserved for the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust and the Shakespeare Institute, both of which are missing signatures, surprise, surprise. This seems to be a gauntlet thrown down at the orthodox Shakespeareans. I don't like being called orthodox, if that's what you're referring to me. And the declaration seems to be sort of simultaneously derived for their small-mindedness, I'm not small-minded, and yet crave acceptance from and happy to welcome anybody. So this is a very interesting uh, quotation. And this sense that keeps coming up from... Um, people against Shakespeare saying, oh, you're small-minded, you're, you're in denial, you're an industry in but denial. But it's thrown in both directions. You're you've you're just called this denial, haven't you? You're defensive. Well, I, unfortunately... I just, what I'm calling denial is the denial of lots of different kinds of evidence, wrapping it all up and saying, oh, it's a homogenous whole. But that's and we what's can being just said on the other it. side as well. The no, trouble it's is not. both it's sides are accusing the other side of denying evidence. What's being, said on, what's being said on the Shakespeare side is, these are individual pieces of evidence, the most likely outcome of which suggests that Shakespeare, Stratford, von Avon wrote the paper. We must move on because I want to get on to questions. I want to remind you briefly that this book is part of the uh, Shakespeare Birthplace Trust authorship campaign. One of its prime expressions was 60minutesforshakespeare.com, where you can hear 60 very prominent people, including the Prince of Wales himself, adding to the discussion and uh, making it live in a, was pure fiction, in, a, in, a, in a vibrant um, and an interesting way. Um, and we also have the great Shakespeare cover. Now, this is where I want to talk about the phrase anti-Shakespearean, as opposed to anti-structural audience. Anti-structural audience is, is, is rhetoric by the um, anti-Shakespeareans. And I hope... Well, how, I used, how is anti-Shakespearean not uh, rhetoric no, from uh, Well, it is. It's in response to... It's trying to, uh, to put oxygen into the debate because you cannot have Shakespeare without Stratford. But you're trying Excuse to me. win the debate by, by changing terms. You're trying to I'm win I'm trying it to put in... By... Well, that's what debates do, isn't it? Well, you, and changing think, the terms is think, a fairly underhand way no, of trying to not, close the debate no, down. No, it's not because basically. behind my change of terms is a philosophical and literary proposition which is as follows, that you cannot remove the author from the context which made that author possible. You wouldn't suggest for a moment that Charles Dickens um, could be separated from his London, or that Michelangelo could be separated from Florence and Rome. Therefore, why should Shakespeare be a special case? Why should you say it's fine to have Hamlet, but it wasn't the man, for, the man from Stratford who wrote it? This to us seemed a nonsense. And actually, it's really interesting that you're finding the term anti-Shakespearean problematic because it was obviously hit a nerve in our use of it. And in covering Shakespeare Stratford uh, up um, on the day that Anonymous was launched, uh, we, were, we were saying, OK, if it's not Shakespeare, remove him entirely from a national life. But that's and we also took a look because Shakespeare it, it the author would imagination. exist, Shakespeare's the plays still exist. Wiped out for a day because it, it, the plays would exist with our understanding of where he came from and who and what be, made him a unique living deepened. and breathing person. Could be deep if we be, had a better idea of who he it's was. Just, it's just been ignored by the anti Shakespeareans. The advert by James Shapiro reminds us of the dismal box office showing for Anonymous, has undoubtedly been a setback for them. It was a poor film. And Emmerich's own admission that the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust shares the blame for his film's rapid demise is an indication that an organised response contributed to that end. Um, the facts and analysis presented in this volume will make responding to the next film or the next campaign or the next question posed about Shakespeare's authorship by a student or a stranger or even a teacher that much easier. And I wonder if that will be the case on both sides. It's time for questions. Thank you, Ros and Stanley, for a most uh, lively discussion.